situated at the heart of the Mediterranean. The islands of Malta offer an abundance of sun, sea and sand. But with its rich and fascinating history, it's also become a mecca for visitors who are drawn by the wealth of breathtaking archaeological sites, cultural monuments and other such treasures that are just waiting to be discovered. Now, we don't usually bore you with history, but we didn't think you could visit Malta without at least soaking up a few of the crusty bits. So first off, from Malta's capital, Valletta, St John's Cathedral. In fact, it's probably the most important monument on the island. Dates way back to 1520 and hides some rather gory pictures, such as the masterpiece of the beheading of St John. The Grand Master's Palace is definitely the place to see armour. Imagine wearing some of this kit on a hot summer's day. One crowd that did was the Knights of St John. They defeated the Turks here in the Great Siege of 1565. That probably changed the fate of Europe, well before any John had ideas on the EC. I don't know what you're smiling about, Tin Face. Huh. The Knights of St John were also pretty good at real estate. They built many fine buildings around the harbour and fortified and designed what was to become one of the first planned cities ever built on the grid system, Valletta. They named it after Jean Parasso de la Valletta, whose guidance ensured their victory against the Turks. One of the best ways to see Valletta is by the sea. One person who did and fell in love straight away was Sir Walter Scott, who described Valletta as the city built by gentlemen for gentlemen. Indeed, this was much the view that Napoleon took when he tootled into the harbour in 1798. His excuse was supplies, but he had other intentions. To cut a long story short, he found a despondent and relaxed order of St John, who surrendered without a single shot fired at the French Navy. The Grand Harbour remains one of the most picturesque ports in Europe, and somehow it manages to be a functional and profitable trading facility at the same time. This must be a fantastic way to see Malta. Yeah, definitely. Um, the Grand Harbour especially has been site for uh, a tremendous amount of uh, civilizations, especially from the time of the Phoenicians. And it has developed into a maritime hub, uh, especially during the 16th century when the Order of St. John came here and settled the Malta. And uh, obviously, uh, this Grand Harbour was co uh, considered strategic even for the French and the British. Parts of it, of course, uh, concerning uh, dry dock facilities, uh, trade, commerce, but other parts are, uh, are for uh, yachting services, marinas, and tourism activities. So what we have here is a combination of two separate things, tourism, tourist-oriented activity and uh, trade, trade and economic activity. And I think that uh, the Grand Harbour strikes a very good balance between the two. Now, if you've got that ocean bug, why not go one step further and charter a yacht or learn to sail? The Med's the perfect place. People come here to learn how to sail, and then they can get, they can get instructions uh, during the week they're here. And uh, they can learn to sail uh, from, you know, they start here knowing nothing, go out of here, hopefully, with uh, enough knowledge and competence to sail their own boats. You can pick up a boat either with crew or without crew, either a bird boat charter or a skipper charter. And the boats, of course, vary in uh, size and type according to clients' requirements and according to clients' qualifications. We've chartered yachts in Greece before, 
and we thought we'd try Malta because uh, we like the Malta coming here uh, on the land and we thought we'd like to come and see what it's like uh, on the boats. We'd been around uh, seeing the sea from the land side but now to see it from the sea is, is really interesting. It's, it's small enough to do it in a week and, and nicely. So would you come back again? Oh, I think so, yes. I mean, why not? It's a beautiful country. I suppose providing you like some history, not not lying on the beach, but I'm not a beach person, so yeah, great. But you did tell me before that you weren't originally interested in the history. No, I wasn't originally interested in the history, but I think the more you come, the more sort of you become involved in it and how fascinated you sort of become by it. Our skipper's now retired in Malta, but does this mean that the wind's now taken out of his sails? Life doesn't stop when you retire, no, it certainly doesn't. And I intend to carry on skippering and um, teaching people to sail and thoroughly enjoying the pleasures that Malta's got to offer from the point of view of sea. And where are you from originally? Manchester, Manchester United. <laughs> so how do, you, how do you find the Maltese? Uh, very keen on football. Um, they are uh, cheerful, happy um, group of people that seem to enjoy the visitors coming into Malta and um, certainly have got a lot to offer. Yeah, the island has a lot to offer. I mean, I was told that I was going to be bored coming out here, but that's not true, is it? No, there's, there's an awful lot to do. You've got everything from the nightlife, um, which is good in, in parts of Malta, uh, through to history, um, through to beautiful scenery, the sand, the sea, diving, sport. You've got just about everything you can do um, in any other country in Malta, and all encapsulated into something like 17 miles by 9 miles wide. Football is the national sport in Malta, but in the summer, the players trade in their football boots for swimming trunks to play water polo. After watching from a safe dry spot, I had to ask what the great attraction is of water polo to the Maltese. Well, water polo, for me, it's, it's a great game, but you really have to be fit to play water polo, really fit. We train in the morning, seven to eight, and we play in the evening. It's the Malta summer game. In football we go for, and in winter we go for football. In the summer, of course, it's water polo. It's natural. We're surrounded by sea. On the whole, water polo looks far too energetic for me. Besides, I didn't take my armbands with me. Nope, I think I'll stick to a less strenuous sport, like bowling. Now this is more like it. Now Malta has a terrific range of accommodation to suit everybody's needs, from two-star hotels to five-star hotels. And if you're feeling flush, then you might as well enjoy yourself and go for the very best, something like Corinthia Palace Hotel. The main building, a former palace, is well converted and offers true five-star service and rooms set in beautifully kept grounds. If you're lucky enough to be on business in Malta, the facilities are second to none. Like every Mediterranean resort, Malta caters for everybody. If you fancy a slightly more relaxed atmosphere, you could look at complexes like St George's Park. Let's take a quick whiz around the pool, shall we?
If life at the hotel pool is just a bit too hectic for you, then don't panic. Malta has some beautiful beaches worth exploring. This is Golden Bay on the west coast, for instance, and like any typical beach resort, there's something here for everyone. Most visitors to Malta keep coming back again and again and again. But why? Surely it can't just be the history. We've been a few years before we had the baby, but now we've got the baby, we came back because we know it's so clean, it's hygienic. The restaurants are always nice, you know, they make the little one very welcome. Nice beaches, you know, the water's nice and shallow for them, makes it safe. But so, I mean, you don't get bored here? Oh no, I can get bored with sun, sea and sand. <laughs> it's paradise, isn't it? No, not at all, you don't get bored. I mean, you go nice walks, it's lovely. Have ticket, we'll travel. Now it says here, the most beautiful spot in Malta. Your once in a lifetime experience, a 20 minute boat trip and you'll find yourself in another world. Yep. This is the Blue Grotto. Seasick tablets are not needed in this case. It's only a short trip, but it's well worth the effort. The view from the bottom of the cliffs is stunning, and the colours beneath the surface are remarkably beautiful. It really is another world. Unless you've been a fish at some point in your life. And then it probably isn't so strange after all. What most people refer to as the island of Malta is in fact a group of islands consisting of Malta, the largest, Gozo and the tiny island of Comino. Moving between the islands couldn't be easier. A regular ferry operates roll-on, roll-off service between Chiricahua in Malta and Imgar in Gozo. Gozo is literally just three miles away from Malta and it's well worth the ferry trip cost is literally about three pounds sterling per adult. If you want to take a car, it's around six pounds. The trip takes just a mere 20 minutes. Gozo is a relatively undiscovered paradise. Whereas the Maltese have always been in contact with the rest of the world, Gozo seems to remain in a time warp and the Gozotians, who seem a friendly lot, so that they could do with a little less tomorrow and feel that Gozo should stay as it was, or as it is now. I tend to agree, I think. I wonder if there's any Irish blood in Gozotians. Still, the walled city looks pretty permanent. The walled city was built to protect the people from invading Turks and pirates who used to come here and take the inhabitants into slavery. So they built a moat of this fortified city first and then surrounded it by a moat. And at sunset, everybody had to sleep within the city, within the citadel. A drawbridge was brought up and everybody felt protected that way. And within the walls, they had everything. They had provisions, they had a water tank, they had gunpowder deposits, churches, hospitals, everything. The walled city is a fantastic place to stroll around and just quite simply take in the views. Sorry. A 
away from the stress of the busy walled city. Not. The pace of life in Gozo is relaxed and laid back. The locals strum harmlessly with good intent, whilst the busy markets in the quaint village squares is just about as hectic as it gets here. It is, however, worth bringing your wallet. Apart from the usual touristic knick-knacks and the customary my mate went to Gozo and all he bought me back was this Lazy t-shirt, you can find some amazing bargains, like crocheted lace and Aran sweaters knitted with local wool, which cost remarkably little. Oop, mind that hat. Whatever you do, don't give up your day job, lads. But what is it that makes Gozo so different from Malta? If you ask a Maltese, they would say the difference is that Gozo is, uh, is greener than Malta and um, it's an easier life and so on. If you ask the Gozotans, they would say the difference is that all the brains in Malta come from Gozo. Uh, and they go out to point that the president and the bishop, they're all, they're all Gozotans by birth, you see. So the, we import brains from Gozo, say the Gozotans. So, you know. <laughs> Such, I mean, the people are so interesting. Do you think that's because, because it's had such an influx of so many nations? Oh yes, over there? they are. They are used to being dominated uh, by various nationalities, and each has left its mark on the population. Uh, we have absorbed the uh, languages from all the people who who were here and who dominated Malta in one way or another. Uh, so we have a few smattering. We have a smattering of French words. We have a obviously a lot of English words and Italian because of the proximity to Italy, but the roots of the language do come from the East Mediterranean. One of the most spectacular sights in Gozo is the Azure window, but what's going on underneath the surface? I've never been diving before, but before you take the plunge, you have to have some quick lessons in a pool. And then, of course, it's time for those last minute instructions on dry land. The, the problem that you might uh, experience more here than the pool is the uh, pressure on your ears. Right. So as soon as we start going down, remember what you've done in the pool, just pinch your nose from the outside of the mask and okay, blow against it. And immediately you'll feel air escaping from the ears, so you're compensating for the ambient pressure you're at. Apart from that, just keep breathing and enjoy yourself. And that's, that's mainly because we're going deeper than the pool. Right. So the deeper we go, the more pressure there is. How, so how deep are we going to go? A maximum of four meters. Maximum. Excellent. Okay. Remember the signals? Yep. Okay. Okay. Not okay. Not okay. Up. Down. Stop. 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 That's it. Okay. You. Yep. Watch me when I'm going to show you a couple of other we'll things. Okay? Sure. People like you would take them for the first time and you see the exhilaration on the, on the face and in their eyes. So it's, 
is the best payment we get. The feeling underwater is just fantastic. Total weightlessness. For once, I'm totally speechless and totally hooked. But how easy is it to learn? It is so easy down there. You don't believe it's so easy the first time. So once you start making students laugh underwater in a, in a safe manner, obviously, that's a good sign that they're relaxed. Anybody who's over 14 years old, from 14 upwards, uh, the first thing they have to do here is, by law, they have to have a medical certificate to state that they're fit for diving. After that, you know, take them to the classroom, show them a couple of videos, explain to them how the equipment works, take them into the pool for the first time and then in the, in the confined water. And after that, if they want to go on the uh, qualification course, in four days they could become qualified divers. Whilst George seems relaxed, he takes his teaching very seriously, yet with just a touch of fun. We stress, though, that you should never try diving at home in the bath. So back to Malta and time for a little more history. So far you've heard a lot about Valletta, pretty spectacular and not to be missed. However you could not visit Malta without visiting Medina. Indeed you can't really go to Malta without seeing Medina. I suppose it's a little like going to Paris and not bumping into the Eiffel Tower. One thing that you can't miss in Malta and that dominates Malta is the old capital Medina. Dating back to Roman and Venetian times it's known now as the silent city because of its few inhabitants. There are literally only 300 people that live here in the city itself. Finally, it was the British, the last foreign rulers of Malta, who were responsible for the final change to Medina's history. As a seafaring nation, they preferred the Great Harbour and turned Valletta into the centre of the islands instead, leaving Medina as the silent city, with vast walls and closed doors. <laughs> What a racket! In complete contrast to Medina, there's enough noise going on here to be heard on the planet Zorb. But what's it all about? Whilst in Malta, one of the things that you mustn't miss is one of the local festas. They happen in all the towns, sometimes more than once a week, so you can't avoid them. They really are cool. This is Zetun, and it's in honour of its patron saint, St. Catherine. If you thought Valletta was impressive by day, you've got to see it by night. The illuminations are well worth a look. You can always start the evening with this magical view and then move from the floodlights to the neon lights of St George's where the atmosphere is as hot as the action. The choice is limitless, but where is the place to be seen? Anyway, I like Axis. Damn, Axis and Six. In fact, we've just been down in Axis and it's really revving. And so to Axis we must go. We've just got to find it first though. So, by public opinion, Axis seems the place to be tonight. Let's go and find out what goes on. Mm -hmm. 